Hi everyone, welcome to the vertical tail design tutorial, which is number 6 in the series. The last video was about the horizontal tail. Some of the basics that were covered there apply as well to the vertical tail, so you can go back to video number 5 to review them if necessary. The vertical tail has a similar purpose as the horizontal tail, but with a difference that there should not be much, if any, load on it during cruise flight. While the horizontal tail has to continuously balance the airplane pitching moments, the vertical tail only has to work when the pilot is maneuvering or when the propeller slipstream changes with the power setting. Its main purpose is to provide directional stability and damping. It has to do that for the range of yaw angles that the pilot is likely to ask for, and the worst case is a side slip here. It is not easy to calculate directional stability accurately in advance for a new design, so small airplane designers usually rely on data from existing airplanes as to what works. A good rule of thumb is to use half the area of the horizontal tail and increase it by 20 to 30 percent. A word of caution though, the effectiveness of the vertical tail is influenced by the position of the wing on the fuselage. On a low wing airplane, the vertical tail is more effective than on a high wing airplane, by up to 40 percent. So if your design is a high wing, increase the vertical tail volume correspondingly. The vertical tail volume can be calculated in the same way as I had explained it for the horizontal tail. In both cases, the tail volume can be further looked at in relationship to the size of the wing. It is not always obvious where the fuselage ends and the vertical tail starts. This sketch shows two different vertical tail designs. For a vertical tail A, it is pretty obvious what the area is. Less so for tail B, which blends much further into the fuselage. Also one could determine the tail area for B in the same manner as for tail A, it is not effectively the same. Because tail B has a much shorter leading edge, it is likely going to be less effective. If the rudder is full span from top to bottom, it should still provide good directional control, but it may offer reduced stability and damping compared to a tail of the design A. Directional stability is not just a factor of the vertical ta tail area after the CG. Any side area in front of the CG influences it as well, in a negative, destabilizing way. This needs to be considered when sizing the vertical tail. An airplane with a nose wheel, and more importantly a nose wheel fairing, has more directionally destabilizing area than a tail dragger. This needs to be compensated by increasing the side area of the airplane aft of the CG and potentially adding a dorsal or ventral fin. The other extreme is a tail dragger with a short stubby nose that off offers very little destabilizing side area. It can get away for the, with a short vertical tail. Another example I want to bring up here is my motor glider, which has a fairly long nose in front of the CG. I needed to compensate for this extra area by using a high aspect ratio vertical tail. It has good directional stability at small yaw angles, but steep stable side slips are possible with only small rudder deflections. This is typical of aircraft with long noses. A T-tail is a bit of a special case because the horizontal tail on top of the vertical tail acts as an end plate or winglet to the vertical tail and improves its efficiency. This means it can be made a little smaller for the same effects. The small drag reduction makes it very popular for the use on gliders. It does require a little more weight to stiffen up the fuselage and vertical tail so that they are able to support the forces from the horizontal tail in this location. A T-tail on a powered airplane is raised above the propeller slipstream. This means that in pitch the feel of the airplane is much the same with power and with idle. This is most noticeable during takeoff, where the missing slipstream on the tail means the airplane may be harder to rotate while the speed is slow. Most, because most pilots are used to have the slipstream 
directly on the hor horizontal tail. It is rarely used on power planes. So does the vertical tail need an incidence? Sort of like the horizontal tail. For most small, fairly low-powered airplanes with the engine in the nose and reasonably sized vertical tails, the answer is no. When I say low-powered, I mean up to about 300 horsepower. The propeller slipstream at slow speed and high power, as during takeoff and climb, does produce a yawing moment, but that is usually easily compensated for with a small rudder deflection or canting the engine to one side. If the rudder forces are high, a small trim tab is easy to add to the rudder to reduce them. Once the engine power gets beyond that, or on installations that have a high static thrust, the yawing moment from the propeller slipstream on takeoff is substantial enough to make it worthwhile to set the vertical tail at an angle to make the airplane more controllable. If the propeller turns clockwise seen from behind as shown here, it produces a yawing moment to the left, which needs to be compensated with right rudder or a vertical tail incidence change leading edge to the left. Another way to reduce yaw from the propeller slipstream is achieved by adding another vertical tail surface underneath the fuselage. The spiraling slipstream hits the surface from the opposite direction and produces opposing yawing moment from what the surface above the fuselage delivers. The lower surface does not need to be the same size as the one above the fuselage. I have something like this on my pulsar which I converted to a tail dragger by designing my own gear installation. I added a streamlined fairing to the tail spring, initially with a non-steerable nose wheel and with an unfaired tail wheel spring. I needed almost full right rudder during takeoff and had to be careful not to advance the throttle too rapidly or it would wear off to the left. This did become critical during situations with a crosswind from the left. With the fairing installed, I now only need a little right rudder to keep it straight during takeoff, and left, left crosswind takeoffs are almost the same as right crosswind takeoffs. The engine torque really has no effect on your or directional control. The propeller rotates about the longitudinal axis, which means that the balancing moment is in roll, and it is easily compensated with the ailerons. You often see vertical tails which have a highly swept back leading edge. Why? In my opinion, this is mostly for looks. It simply makes the airplane look faster and more elegant. Aerodynamically, it has some advantages and some disadvantages. Unless it is used on a supersonic airplane, sweep back will reduce the effectiveness of the surface, especially at high angles of attack like during stalls. The component of the airflow that is parallel to the leading edge is useless for us. Only the airflow component that is perpendicular to the leading edge produces the forces we are interested in. The size of the vertical tail will need to be larger and therefore heavier the more it is swept back. Some leading edge sweep back is beneficial when it comes to side slips. It may help reduce or prevent rudder force reversal at large yaw angles but I don't see the need for more than 20 degrees of sweep. With this I want to wrap it up here. Next time we will go into more detail on the control surfaces.